Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Barry Schiff and Brian Schiff are here with us. And uh, it's, it's, I can tell you right now, <laughs> it's going to be a barrel of laughs and extremely informative. And we appreciate all of you joining us tonight, obviously, before the presidential debate. And rest assured, we will have you back to that uh, in time at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, until then, a couple quick notes. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll be showing a few pictures along uh, with tonight. If you're working on a mobile device, you can swipe left and right, back and forth to see the cameras as well as the images that are being shown. In addition to that, um, uh, tonight's broadcast will be recorded, of course, and put up on our YouTube channel. Simply search for social flight, one word, social flight, and uh, that'll get you recording. Usually takes us a day or two to be able to get that up. And in keeping with that, be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. It's where we have tens of thousands of aviation events, webinars, destinations, so many things to keep you flying. And that is what we are all about here at Social Flight. We are just here dedicated to supporting general aviation. And so with that, I would like to begin by bringing, and I'm going to uh, send the message right now here, by bringing uh, Barry Schiff online with 28,000 hours logged in more than 355 types of aircraft. I can't help but laugh seeing that uh, mask on you. <laughs> Are we separated? Yes. Barry Schiff is an aviation legend. Uh, he holds Five world speed records received numerous honors for his many contributions to aviation safety, including a congressional commendation, among many, many others. Captain Schiff has been inducted into the New Jersey Aviation Hall of Fame, the EAA NAFI National Flight Instructors Hall of Fame, and was recently elected an elder statements, statesman excuse me, of aviation by the National Aeronautic Association. In January of 2012, he was inducted as a living legend of aviation and as an award-winning journalist and author, he has written numerous books, over 1,700 articles in 111 aviation magazines, including AOPA Pilot. And uh, Barry, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. You're talking about me? I am talking about you. And you are joined this evening by your son, as you might imagine for a true aviation family, Captain, oh, there we go, Captain Brian Schiff has made his own name in aviation. He's a captain for a major US airline, is type rated on a long list of commercial and business aircraft. And since 1985, Brian has held several flight instructor ratings, is recognized for his enthusiasm and ability to teach in a way that simplifies complex procedures and concepts. And those accomplishments include having been an FAA designated examiner. So anyone who needs their check ride, I think you're going to be able to handle that tonight. Is that correct? Absolutely. Can I confirm social distancing exists? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's right. My, we are very social distance across coasts. So that should be that my son, out. you know. <laughs> Guys, thank you so, so much for joining us here on Social Flight Live. Um, Barry, I, I'd like to start with you uh, because obviously if you go back chronologically, t uh, that's, that's where all this starts. T tell me the story. How, how did you be go from pre-aviation Barry Schiff to the, the Barry Schiff that w we all grew up hearing about and reading about and everything like that? Well... It all happened because I was a juvenile delinquent. At the age of 13, my parents decided to send me back east. I lived in LA to get away from the guys I was hanging around with. And so they put me on a North American Airlines DC-4 to get rid of me for the summer. And it whisked me away from Burbank to Wichita to uh, Midway to LaGuardia. And during that flight, I looked out the window and I could not believe looking at those wings, that they kept us up in the air. I knew they did. I didn't know how. They weren't flapping. They weren't doing anything. How did it keep this monster in the air? And those engines were spitting fire. It was like a prehistoric beast. Uh, it aroused my curiosity. And when I arrived in my little hometown in New Jersey with my grandparents, I went to the library, found a book that began to enthrall me about aviation. I still have it because I stole it. 
I told you I was a juvenile delinquent at the time. And when I got back to LA uh, at the end of the summer, I went to Santa Monica Airport, began hitchhiking rides, and it went from there. Wow. And and what was the transition now? To, to you say it went from there. That's an awfully short abbreviation for uh, for for moving your way up through the ranks, both uh, professionally and then also publicly. You flew a couple well, airplanes. A couple. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, my parents didn't want me to fly. They were totally opposed to it. Mine and didn't so either. I, I, had, <laughs> I had to do it behind their backs. And uh, it all worked out well until the instructor called the house one day to tell my parents to tell me the airplane wouldn't be ready that day. When I got home, all hell broke loose. It was really bad. <laughs> oh, no. But I, it wouldn't stop me. I had to keep flying. And they never, ever approved of my flying until I got a job at TWA as a pilot, and they started to receive free passes to travel around the world. <laughs> then it was okay, my son the pilot, how wonderful. <laughs> oh my God, that's that's fantastic. And then, you know, and, and by the way, so then there, you know, there there's some, some obviously family connection, we have some pictures of this as well. And so you, you said, so to talk about kind of a family thing, I'm gonna go and bring up a picture here that um, you said uh, is essentially uh, kind of uh, predates Brian's first flight. Well, it wasn't his first flight, but it was close to it. Uh, that was my first wife, Sandy, who is uh, Brian's mother, and she was nine months pregnant at the time. Can't tell that from here, but she was. And I was her instructor. And we went to the uh, AME to get her a medical certificate and the AME wasn't sure he could give her one because she was nine months pregnant. And the FAA finally said, well, that's kind of a normal condition. We approve. So I released Sandy on her first solo flight, Brian obviously going along for the ride, but it was the safest student I ever had because there was no way she could pull the control wheel far enough back to stall the airplane. <laughs> so Brian was responsible for maintaining safety on that flight. And this began my career in aviation safety. And and Brian, you started early, right? Because because here's another picture here. This looks like uh, your you, you, this is uh, what from a recent art auction. Yeah, I drew that a couple of years ago when I was bored during the you know the day off. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember drawing that down there. I think it says I was seven years old. But apparently, yeah, I have a, a fascination. Well, we, can't, we can't figure out whether that's a pusher with a canard or a regular airplane, because the ailerons are either on the front of the wing or the back, depending on how you look at it. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We'll, uh, we'll cut them some slack there, because this is one more from, uh, from the archives here. Um, that was my TWA captain checkout right there when I was getting checked out as a, a TWA captain. <laughs> <laughs> Before the age limitation, those were better days. Right, right. <laughs> That's Brian as a kid. And Brian, tell everybody about that airplane. It's interesting because we looked back in Dad's logbook for the day that I went to the airport with him and he took those photos, got the uh, end number of that aircraft, and as it would happen, that I did fly that same airplane as captain for TWA about 30 years later. How amazing is that? That is, that, that just, uh, um, that, that amazes me. I mean, we've got, did if, was there something, was it really sentimental to you when you actually figured that out or did you figure it out after you'd flown it? I thought, no, I thought it was really cool that I upgraded in, as a captain on the Boeing 727, first of all, which is, you know, they say when you get to be this age and you're, the airplanes that you've flown are all in the Smithsonian, you're, you're really this age. But, but that was a great airplane. I flew a flight engineer, a co-pilot and captain and Czech airman, and, and I taught on it. I loved the 727. When I later found out that that was the same one that Dad flew, it both was exciting and frightened me at the same time that I'm flying an airplane that old. <laughs> wow, it is um, <clears throat> it, it is tr truly amazing. Now, Barry, kind of going back. So obviously, you're you're a um, a captain for TWA. When did you start writing? When did when I mean, it, so many, you know, adventures ended up with going pen to paper at some point. Well, I started writing when I was 21, and I wasn't a writer, but I developed an idea for an aviation education product when I was 21, uh, making LP phonograph recordings of uh, 
communications and navigation and flight. And I had to write the narration for those things. And uh, that was then, that company I sold uh, three years later to that, that fellow uh, screenwright. Uh, his name is uh, Elroy Jeppesen. He bought my company from me. And those are some of the records that I'd produced. Now, an interesting story about Jeppesen. He was an incredible guy. You talk about a legend. But he had a thing about his height. He was short. And when we sat down to have this picture taken, his head was about a foot below mine. I was 6'2". He might have been 5'6". I don't know. And then, <laughs> at any rate, he wouldn't allow the picture to be taken until they put some telephone directories on the chair so that we could be at eye level. For all you kids out there, you would have to stack about 10 iPhones on the chair to get out to that. <laughs> <laughs> What's a phone book? <laughs> exactly. What's a record? <laughs> yeah. So then you have a few others here with, with a number of other famous people. Well, I started writing finally for a magazine uh, in 1963. I was 25 at the time. And I started getting some assignments while I was uh, both flying for TWA and and meeting interesting people. That's Buzz Aldrin. And I wrote a, an article about him and, and our interview together uh, not long after he had made his uh, famous flight on Apollo 11. And I might great add, time. you put, you put flight chops to, to shame here in this shot. Say again? <laughs> Putting you flight put chops flight. to shame. <laughs> yeah, put flight chops to shame with your sideburns. Well, I was trying to be a Burt Rattan. I couldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was one of my favorite students, Jill St. John. Uh, I taught her to fly, and it, it was a distraction teaching her to fly. <laughs> it wasn't easy. <laughs> Couldn't think she, about it. Was she a good all. pilot? Did you notice or not? Pardon? Did, was she a good pilot? Did you notice or not? Yeah, actually, she was, she was very good, uh, a, a good stick. She really was. Uh, she gave it up a little too soon after she married uh, Lance Reventlow. But uh, she, was, she was great. I'll tell you one thing. When, when the guys, the linemen, would come out and put a ladder by the 172 so she could go up and climb up on the wings, and it was a really short ladder, so she had to stretch way over <laughs> to reach the fuel tank. And the guys would come out with their cameras and take pictures. She was kind of foxy, you know. They had a tall ladder, but they hit it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Here's another one. Oh, yeah. While I was a student pilot, I was also a, a lineman at uh, Bell Air Service back at Santa Monica Airport, uh, what later became Gunnell Aviation. And the airplane that was built to be in the movie, The Spirit of St. Louis, was kept at our FBO. And, and that's Jimmy Stewart standing next to me, although you might not recognize him. And they wanted me once a week to start that engine and taxi out in the Spirit of St. Louis just to keep the engine running. I'm Keep jealous water. of that. And that, that. I can't tell you what that was like. Never flew it though. Uh, did you? You, you, you want? Did, did you attempt it or no? No, no, I didn't have enough experience to try that. Although many years later, I flew the one that the EAA built, its replica of the Spirit of St. Louis, and wrote an article about what that was like, and that was, that was something. Wow, that's. Uh... Uh, that's that's truly amazing. Now, I, I have to confess, uh, you know, obviously I've been a fan for a very long time. And uh, when I, I remember one of the things that, that sticks with me and that I actually dug out the old VHS tape to show both of my boys, Jake and Ben, who are, uh, Jake has now got his ticket and Ben is close to getting his private pilot license. And uh, I showed them a video that you did on uh, that happened to do with primary flight control systems and backup control systems and how you could fly the plane in other ways. And in that video, you were in a 172 that you 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 didn't touch the yoke during the flight. You used the doors for turning, you used the trim, and you used the power in, uh, as controls and completely controlled and landed the aircraft in that. How did that yeah. come about? Well, I was challenged. Somebody said, you know, you're pretty good at flying that airplane, but can you fly it without using the flight controls? And I thought a lot about it. And uh, with another instructor on board, I tried a few uh, theories on for size. And after not too long a period, I was able to take off and land without ever touching uh, the rudder pedals or the control wheels. 
And eventually he worked that into his flight instructing shtick because when he was teaching me to fly, he made me do the same thing, which actually was a very good experience. So, so tell me something about that, Brian, from your perspective, obviously, you know, you, flight training is a huge part of your background. And what, not only, I mean, I can see from a family perspective, of course, it would have been natural for you to do that. But what, how did you learn how to teach and then, and then add your own flavor to it? <laughs> well, obviously, I had uh, some very big footprints to follow and, and step in. And, and I had a great teacher. Uh, dad, and I've had several flight instructors, and you say you are a combination of all the flight instructors that you've had, and of course, him, dad was one of the greatest influences, but I had many more flight instructors with whom I've flown, and I take the parts that I like and turn that into me, uh, and, and I was always the guy would take any student, so I remember when I first got my CFI, I was in college, and they said, here, let's throw these students at him. This, this lady has 100 hours and can't solo. Here's a guy that can't do a stall recovery. And, and I got all these problem students. And I think that was motivation for me to try to figure out a way. I was like, challenge accepted. So I would take <laughs> these students. And, and, you know, I found a way to do it. I think pretty much anybody can be taught if you adjust the way you're teaching and the way that you present a topic or a subject to them. And I found that it was very rewarding for me to take a challenging student, someone who was really having trouble, and then see it, it finally click with them. And I, I employed many tricks. And sometimes I had to call dad and say, look, I got a student doing this, this, and this. And he'd come up with some great ideas. Uh, you know, and incidentally, when he was teaching me to fly, he wrote these nice comments in my logbook. <laughs> Key wrench. <laughs> Two more crashes under control. Instructor yeah. made a greaser. Nice. Yeah, so, Excellent. So Very motivational. Shaming the student. enforcement dad. Exactly. That was in the uh, family Centabria. By the way, the reason that Brian is really a good instructor, maybe even a great one, is that he thinks long and hard about what he's doing and how he does it, and he tailors what he says and does to the individual student. And he, and he thinks long and hard about what he can do to make this a better pilot. He's really good at it, and he's able to explain complex issues, as you said in the beginning, in simple ways, so people can understand them. It makes better pilots out of them. He's, he's really quite good. That's because that's the only way I can understand complex issues with my simple mind. <laughs> right. Yep. Brian, did you notice, like, one of the things that, that I've found is, as both my boys have gone through training is you you end up with uh, them coming and they're doing things very different from you, and then you have that discussion of, well, okay, I do it differently, or instructor selling you another thing. Um, how did you guys negotiate that between the, the two of you or even when you fly together? Well. I can tell you there were some silent dinners after flying lessons at some points, either, you know, when I was recovering from being beaten upside the head with a sectional chart or <laughs> get a tongue lashing for trying to do something that was unsafe. Uh, I learned a philosophy because I learned what he, what he lived. So we, we took family trips together. We'd fly somewhere, you know, in a friend's 414 and I'd watch and I'd observe and I'd see aggressively safe pilot in dad. And I would learn from that. And I took a lot away from his example. So we, you know, students learn what they live. And, it, and if an instructor says to do it one way, but yet does it another way, uh, the student's going to think it's okay. And he did a lot of things to set a really good example for me and, and had a very conservative attitude towards safety. But you asked how we reconciled differences. We, we honestly, I don't think we had very many. Um, you know, when, when people came up and uh, we're constantly interrupting our lunch or breakfast or flying lesson to say that they're a fan of his. It, it made me think, you know, this guy must know what he's talking about. I'll pay you for that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I mean, that's, that's, it's really interesting. I mean, you end up d developing obviously your own approach to it. You mentioned a, a very interesting phrase I haven't heard before, ag aggressive safety. Yes. Yes, and, and there was a poster hanging on the walls of TWA Training Center that, uh, that you'd see it every time you went to recurrent training, and it said, uh, you know, uh, uh, something about a pilot being aggressively safe. That is the, the motto of how we treat safety, and, and is you have to be proactive about safety. Pilots can't just get in their cars and drive, in their airplanes and fly like you and I get in our cars and drive. We need to be aggressive and proactive about finding what's going to get us you know it's it's the the demon that we don't find in the mm -hmm. pre-flight that's going to get us and it's 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 that lackadaisical attitude of just getting in and going and trusting that everything will always work 
that's the attitude. So we need to take an aggressive approach toward, toward safety. There were a lot of signs at the TWA Training Center. My favorite one was the most important wings on an airplane are on the pilot. Ooh, I like that. And incidentally, that question, that poster was hanging up in the interview room when I interviewed at TWA. And the first question in my interview was, read this poster. What do you think of that? What does that mean to you? And I thought it meant about the income and paying bills and, and how much am I going to earn? No, <laughs> I'm kidding. But yeah, it's, it's the decisions that are made. Most airplane accidents happen as a result of the pilot making a mistake or a poor choice. Uh, you know, sometimes the, the airplane actually breaks and the wings can snap off. This, these things can happen, but uh, like the poster said, the most important wings are on the pilot because of the decisions he has to make. So I'm, I'm curious between, you know, especially it, maybe you each have different answers to this. What do you think, starting with you, Barry, is perhaps the most important trait um, of, of a flight instructor? Oh boy, the most, I don't know what the most important would be, but there are several that really are. I think patience and understanding are really important and mm. to instill a safety mode, to instill a safety <laughs> culture. Uh, that's really important. And I, I always tried to teach, and, and this was not a part of the curriculum, but I always taught that it was never really very important, so important that you had to get someplace. Mm -hmm. you, no trip was so important that you couldn't postpone it if conditions warranted you're not leaving. In fact, Brian called me one day, I'll never forget this, he had a little champ out in St. Louis, and it was really, really windy, and he was upset, he called me, he couldn't go, the wind was too strong, and my comment to him was, that's probably one of the best flights he's ever made, even like though we're going off the ground. I did like taxi that. out, and I got a gust of wind that lifted up one wheel and set it back down, and I thought, Somebody's trying to tell me something. <laughs> and uh, another tail dragger pilot I know told me once, if you can taxi it to the runway in a tail dragger, that it's the winds are okay for takeoff. Uh, I'm not sure I totally agree with that, but I will say uh, I, I, I barely got it to the runway, and it was difficult. And, and I, I did throw in the towel on that flight, and I remember calling Dad and telling him about it. Interesting. Uh, so, so Great judgment. Great judgment. So Brian, as a what are your thoughts as a as a flight instructor or evaluating a flight instructor? What the like? What are the qualities? What do you look at as, as being some of the most valuable things? I'm going to say it's a two way tie between having a little bit of fear and having confidence in yourself. Uh, you need to do like a, a flight instructor who doesn't have the confidence to go up and do stalls is going to port, you know relay that onto his student. He's going to reflect that to his student, and the student will have a lack of confidence. The lack of confidence will also make him ride the flight controls. Who's ever gotten a checkout and you feel the other instructor right there on the controls with you? Uh, and I think that's because there's a lack of self-confidence in themselves that makes them ride the controls with you. And when that happens to you as a student, then you're going to also have a lack of confidence. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as the fear goes, a little bit of fear is okay. There's a balance, but a little bit of fear keeps you looking for what's going to get you. We're looking for what is wrong, looking for a reason not to fly, uh, rather than overlooking some things that, should, that are trying to tell you not to fly. Interesting. You know, along those lines, uh, someone once asked me, what's the most important instrument in an airplane? The most important, the one that will keep you the safest. And some people were saying an airspeed indicator and so forth. And I thought about it for a while. And I said, no, uh -uh. the single most important instrument in an airplane is your gut. Because if you feel something isn't quite right, then it's not. You probably shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. And that gut is more important, I think, than any other instrument in the airplane. I agree. And in the words of Vern in the movie Over the Hedge, listen to your tail when it tingles. If the tail tingles, I'm trying to tell you something. It's a good is that point. A dirty, is that a dirty joke? <laughs> Take it however you want. Interesting. Um, so uh, backing up to, you know, uh, tell a little bit more from the story perspective of this, you sent a few other pictures I want to touch on too. And um, one of them here is, um, uh, this was from a pretty legendary uh, experience that you had, Barry. Yeah, well, Brian and I had it together. Uh, Brian oh, is uh, see, uh, that... right there and I'm the one in the white shirt. 
And the little guy is uh, King Hussein of Jordan. Uh, and uh, to the left is his son, Prince Faisal. We organized a fly-in from, uh, from Israel in Jerusalem to Amman, Jordan. It was the first time anybody in a commercial military or any kind of an airplane was allowed to fly between those two countries. It was right after the uh, peace treaty had been signed. And we organized a fly-in, 31 airplanes, 135 pilots and passengers. And we were the guests of King Hussein uh, during that fly-in. And we were there for 24 hours. It was a thrilling, thrilling experience. And in it this showed photo, the, it showed that people really can get along. Yeah, this photo was taken in an anteroom just prior to King Hussein, who was going to speak to the entire group of pilots and passengers, all all 135 and and guests. And just beforehand, we were ushered into this room, and it was just the four of us, two fathers and two sons, talking about aviation. Although one of them happened to be king and prince, and the other couple happened to be, you know dad and me <laughs> it was you very mean king, you mean king and prince of a country and king and two prince of and two princes <laughs> <laughs> i gotta tell you a very funny story the, uh, prince who's a uh, king hussein asked me he said uh, barry uh, while you're in uh, jordan is there anything i can do for you and i didn't expect that i mean what what am i supposed to request or ask for and i thought you know what would really be neat i said would it be possible to get a jordanian pilot's license then I'd have a Jordanian and an Israeli license. That'd be kind of neat. And he said, of course, really. I, I said, really? You can do that for me? And he said, Barry, I'm the king. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, so you have, the, do you, you have that, that? That must be. I do. I do. Talk I, about uh, a I got back from uh, the Middle East about a week later. I got a letter in the mail from the head of their FAA, so to speak. And it, it requested some information so they could issue the license, and they, they wanted a check for $2. <laughs> I said, okay. That's where I draw the line. <laughs> you, know, you know, honestly, it was okay, but you're the king. I thought you were going to pick up the tab. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got an Israeli pilot's license. I think he's the only plant, man on the planet with one of each. Yeah, I think so. I was at the time, anyway. That's amazing. Utterly amazing, and 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 Brian, obviously, you know, you you're part of this whole trip too. So, what were you what were you guys flying? We were in a Britain Norman Islander. Um, wow! And it was very surreal to look at the sectional chart and read the note that warned aircraft of Israeli registry not to cross the Jordan River or else they'd be shot down. And so here we were in all these Israeli registered aircraft crossing the Jordan River. In fact, I remember taking a photograph of the main landing gear uh, tire as we crossed over the river, because that was a very momentous moment. Plus, I thought that might be the last photo I ever took. <laughs> <laughs> you hope everyone got the message about what your flight was. Yeah. yeah, but as it turned out, the Jordanians were probably among the most hospitable people I've ever met, the way they treated us. Uh, it was just amazing and very emotional to see uh, pilots from Israel who flew in the Israeli Air Force or fought in the war and Jordanian pilots talking to each other about aviation. Talk about something that can transcend religion, politics, anything you want. You get some pilots in a room, just go to Oshkosh. And none of that matters. It's just that we're all pilots. And that was just wonderful. Very true. Now, Speaking of kind of bringing people together, let me switch to this one over here. Um, this is. Why am I afraid when he's going to switch pictures? Oh, yeah. Because you never know. You really do never know. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a photograph of me in 1989. I was flying for TWA or soon after I'd been hired as a flight engineer on the 727. I was based in Frankfurt, Germany, flying the Berlin, what was then called the Berlin Corridor. And so we flew from Frankfurt to uh, West Berlin, which was in East Germany, and we'd cross. We had to stay in this corridor, and it was controlled by, you know, the five governments, the American, the English, the Germans, the French, and, and I think the Russians. And so you never knew which controller you were going to get, but you had to stay in the corridor. You were at 3,000 feet, and there was no speed limit. So cruising at 3,000 feet in a 727 at about 340 knots indicated was a, was a hoot. And, uh, and, and as it turns out, that, that was me 
we we used one of the company cars while we had a, a ground stop in Berlin. And December of 89, when I was there, the wall was coming down. Uh, and everybody was there chipping away at it, and we're tearing it down. And, and I actually have a piece of it right here that I, I could share with everybody. That's a piece of the Berlin Wall. And I have several pieces that I chopped off myself. What a piece of history. And you'll notice through the hole in the wall is an East German guard uh, watching me do so, at, you know, before he would have shot anybody doing such a thing. And we, we, I have another photo of myself reaching through that hole and shaking hands with him. And we wound up, you know, he couldn't speak a lick of English and I didn't speak, East, you know, German. I, I can, I can know how to order a beer, but that was about it. And we exchanged our, our cap emblems. I have his and, and he has mine, my TWA cap emblem. And just what a symbolic gesture that was. And to be a part of that history when the wall was coming down was just amazing. That's, that's, that's really something. And, and I mean, I assume, uh, you know, Barry, have you, you've flown to a lot of different places. Uh, what, what's been your experiences in flying to countries sometimes that are n not as easy to get into or not as, uh, you know, a aviation seems to be, of course, the, the gateway even to countries that are closed otherwise. Aviation is the common bond between a lot of people. Uh, I, I had the great pleasure in the early 70s of having been assigned the around the world flight. This was in 1972 and three. I got to fly once around the world, once a month. I'd be gone for 11 days and then <laughs> home for 19. It's not bad duty. Uh, and in flying around the world, you met people from every country all over. And you found that when you got to talking about airplanes, everybody melted. They were all the same people. We had something in common. We were common bonds. In fact, I'd been invited to fly light airplanes in many of the countries that we dropped in on. It was just just a great experience. People and, don't have people don't have to be at war. Any any particular memories of some of the most closed places that you've flown uh, over the years? Well, a lot of interesting experiences. Uh, some that uh, I, I enjoy recalling. We had to make a ground stop in uh, Bangkok and we were going to be on the ground for three hours because we had a small me mechanical problem. And uh, the, the, the supervisor there at our Bangkok uh, terminal took us over to a restaurant so that we could have something to eat. And there were four guys, a captain, first officer, flight engineer, and a purser, and four flight attendants. And we all ordered our food, great breakfast. We were all hungry. And they served us, and we started eating. And then we noticed the girls had not been served. And the girls are kind of worried, well, where, where are our meals? And got the waitress over, and the waitress said, uh, you can't eat until the men are done. Wow. They didn't like that. No, I wouldn't imagine I they why. would. It's good to be in America. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Then the men wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. um it, it it's now I, I mean, we were uh, at one point uh, hoping to make a, a trip to uh, Cuba but obviously at the moment that's not something uh, aside from the pandemic even legally that's that's been reopened so it's interesting to see how different places have opened and closed over the years um, in terms of their abilities to go in. It's interesting as you cross the country on a transcontinental flight to hear the California accent and you get into southern you hear a southern accent you'll get a, a Chicago the Bears accent you'll get New York accent when you get to the East Coast <clears throat> but then flying globally around the world you get all kinds of different accents and it's interesting just hearing the entire exchange and it puts into perspective all the different borders you're crossing and in fact the most interesting border I ever crossed was going from uh, we were flying to uh, I believe we we're going to Romania but we had to cross India and then cross into Pakistan and they don't coordinate your handoff there. In fact, I believe the chart says that you need to establish permission before you're 100 miles from their border and you got to have two radios and you've got to do your handoff and coordinating yourself. Otherwise, you better start holding. Do not cross the border coming from one country into the other. Uh, so things like that are very interesting. I also crossed that border at night, which incidentally, for as far as the eye could see, is lit. Really? Yeah, I remember I was, I was going into uh, to, uh, Cairo for the first time uh, in a 707, and uh, the controller asked us if this was our first time going into Cairo, and uh, we said yes, affirmative, and he said, okay, extend your downwind leg five miles, and we didn't know why. There was no traffic, none at all, 
And as we approached the five mile point, we found ourselves abeam the Great Pyramids. And then turning on the base, we just made a pylon around the pyramids. It was an incredible sight. Wow, song. that's cool. That's, that's and they did that for all arriving traffic who hadn't done it before. Oh, that's so amazing. Is there, and, you know, Brian, what have the, you, know, you did a lot of international flying. What, what, other than your trip to Berlin and having that, what else sticks out in your mind? Well, I remember landing in Athens one time, and this was in 89 as well, maybe 90, early 90, in a 727, and it was not long after the hijacking that TWA had had, where they made the landing in Athens and, and were hijacked on the ground for a while. Uh, or no, they went to Beirut, I believe. In, in any event, uh, being accompanied to the gate by a tank on each side of the aircraft was a memorable experience. Uh, the security in a lot of the European and Eastern European countries was a, a memorable experience, as was, uh, uh, I remember one time <clears throat> flying Gulfstream, and for the corporation we were flying, they had a stop in, t in Tel Aviv, and then the next stop was in uh, a Middle Eastern country. But you couldn't fly from one to the other. You wouldn't want to have a stamp in your passport. So we had two passports to use so we could have a stamp for Israeli stamps in one and not in the other because if they saw you came from Israel they'd give you more trouble and in really? fact the flight the flight plan sometimes we'd go to another more favorable country before having to go and land in the other Middle Eastern country that did not have relations with Israel and and I remember that was uh, an interesting way to have to go. So you actually had more than one passport in order to make that happen? Yes yeah I didn't even know that was a possible thing. Yeah, you can order a second passport, and, and if you're traveling to countries that don't get along, that's where you'd want to separate their stamps. <laughs> it's something you don't think about every day. I thought only spies could do that. Traffic control can be a real problem. Yeah. Uh, on a flight from Bombay to Tel Aviv, you can't fly over Syria. You can't fly over Saudi Arabia, but back in those days, we could fly over Iran. So we went directly over Tehran, up over Turkey, and then down to uh, uh, Tel Aviv, and it added an hour to the flight. But today, wow. of course, you wouldn't be able to fly over Iran either. So connecting those two cities by air, Bombay and Tel Aviv, is extremely challenging and can add and, about an hour and a half to your flight time now. And that's still an issue today, right? Certainly is. Amazing. And I, and and there, there's so many things that I think people don't really realize about, you know, the rest of the world outside the United States. Aviation is so free here and, and it can be so challenging uh, in other parts of the world. Yeah, but you know, it's the pilots of all these countries get along really well. Uh, there are all kinds of stories about aircraft having problems and communicating with pilots of another country with whom their country was an enemy, so to speak. Russian pilots and all kinds of pilots. We talk to each other and help each other out even though our, politically speaking, we're at war. Fascinating. And, and have, have either of you spent time, uh, have you flown to the Soviet Union uh, at the time, or now Russia? Um, I've landed in Moscow once, and that was in the 727 as well. And then I've also landed there for fuel in a Gulfstream 4. It was a fuel stop in, uh, in Pet. I can only say the abbreviated version of it, Petro. Mm -hmm. Petro. Pavlovskov, oh, it's, I don't know how you say it. Anyway, I remember doing that, and it was very uh, complex and demanding. So, you know, if you ran into pilots, it's one thing, but the operators and insurance and, and, and the mil militia there and everybody wanting to get their hands and everything was difficult. It was kind of like that in Mexico also. I flew Learjets all around Mexico, uh, and, and you had to have what we carried, a, a whole wad of Mexican bribe money. We call it beer money, but bribe money. Uh, when they wanted to see certain papers, and you gave them the papers, and they're 100% in order, but if it didn't have a $100 bill laying on top of it, they weren't in order. And, wow. and that's just the way it was down there. Or no fuel, no jet no jet fuel today. And mm. so you say, can you find any jet fuel? Well, we can look. And you hand them a couple hundred dollars, and all of a sudden there's jet fuel. And do you, that do was think, a normal thing down there. Do you think it's still yeah. like that in, in many parts of the world? Yeah, I think it is in some places. Some places in Mexico, I know it's still like that. And I, I've talked to pilot friends who go down to certain cities. The bigger cities generally not. Like the yeah, cities I was, flying, I was flying a Twin Beach down to Acapulco. And I landed at the, a border city. I think it was Hermosillo was my first airport of entry. And I had to get some weather. And I was directed to this little shack over here, which was the weather shack. And I walked in and 
there's this guy leaning back in a chair, his feet up on the desk, and he says, "Si, sí, senor." And I said, "I want the weather for Acapulco." He There's said, "Oh, the weather to Acapulco. <laughs> the weather to Acapulco is nice." I said, "What? Do you mean? <laughs> the weather to Acapulco is always nice." <laughs> that was that, and I had to pay a hundred pesos for that. <laughs> All right. Um, so now, talking about aircraft, both of you have flown an amazing list of aircraft and so it, they're just in so many categories it's too much to even break down but if you were going to take something that let's say large number of our audience here might fly in general aviation some something something a little closer to earth for the rest of us what would what would each of your favorites be and brian i'm gonna start with you oh cessna 172 really uh, no how gratuitous <laughs> is that one <laughs> No, I, I think try to get in Warbirds. You know, I, I've had a couple opportunities. I'm still waiting to get into a P-51, but I remember flying a T-6 with Dad, and what a blast that was. Even though it was just a trainer, it was nostalgic, a lot of fun, hearing that engine belch to life, something with a radial engine. It's just so beautiful sounding and uh, takes you back a few steps. You feel like you're going back in history. Um, tail draggers. Second, you know, any tail drag, any airplane I'm in is my favorite at that time, you know, and I pet it. Nice airplane. And and but I do love tail draggers. It's a lot of fun. That's an, Barry. What about you? If you're going general aviation here, well, that's really tough because it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If it's a beautiful, warm summer evening, Stearman open cockpit biplane cannot be beat. I mean, that's just special. If you want a thrill for yourself, Brian called it the P-51, and there's nothing more fun than that. That's if you. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, hey, Brian, when we finish this little project behind us, it's three quarters scale, but, but uh, you go up in our T-51. I'll take you up on that. I would love it. Now, what are you powering it by? That, uh, this is uh, powered by a, a V8 engine through a reduction drive from Titan Aircraft. Wow. So You're not it's basically a, a Corvette engine. No V12 Merlin? No, no. We'll, take, uh, we'll stick with the 8 on, on this one. It, uh, it's good, good enough to, to stick you back in your seat and... On the test flights I've done over there with the factory, uh, uh, it, it's not it's not for speed racing at Reno. At Reno, it's it's for uh, you know lying back, looking straight up, and still climbing. It's it's crazy. When do you think you'll have it finished? You've been asking all the questions. Why did they call that engine a Merlin? Please tell me. Well, everyone thinks it's because it it's magical and it's a wizard and does all kinds of great things. All Rolls Royce named all of its engines after birds. And a Merlin, oh. is a, a Merlin is a bird. Interesting. I've never seen an RB211 bird. <laughs> <laughs> very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. But, yeah, when we have it done, we'll certainly have you uh, come up here. I want to go back to a story that has been out there before, but I, I want to hear it directly from you so we can talk about it. And that is uh, the picture I'm going to bring up right now here. Um, where you uh, decided to take your plane to the beach. <laughs> uh, didn't decide to do that. Um, see the fellow in the middle, his name is Griff Horner. And we were both 18 years old and I was teaching him to fly. Eight, 18, always, by the way, great, great age for total responsibility while flying. <laughs> or lack thereof. <laughs> uh, and he, he always would enter a power off stall without putting on the car piece. He just kept forgetting to put on the carpet. And one day he, he did it for the fourth or fifth time and I just got so upset with him. What I decided to do was shut the engine off and pretend we had carburetor ice. The magneto switch in an Aronka is behind the front seat pilot, which is where he was seated. So I could turn the mags off and he wouldn't know it. And all of a sudden at the top of the stall, the prop came to a stop. It just mm, got arrested wasn't moving. I said, oh my God, Griff, you caused us to have an engine failure. You didn't put on the carb heat. We had carburetor ice. Look what you did. I got the airplane. I knew what was going to happen. I put the nose down. The prop would spin. Did not have an electrical starter, but I knew that it would spin and the airplane would, uh, <laughs> the engine would start and that would be that. So I put the nose down to the red line, 129 miles per hour. That's the red line of that thing. <laughs> and the prop just got hung up on a compression stroke. It just kind of sat there. It wouldn't move. And I thought, oh, my God, this thing's not going to start. 
we got down to about a thousand feet and we're over the beach. That's what happened. And the cop came along and gave me a parking ticket <laughs> for illegally parking a motor vehicle on a public beach. Nice guy. Anyway, the, the judge threw it out. What were you pointing at? What was I pointing at? Yeah. The airport. Yeah. <laughs> That way. I'm sorry, I don't follow. In the photo, Looks like you're, you're pointing. pointing somewhere. Oh, that's where it happened. Oh. <laughs> we were up in the we sky. We were right up in the sky there. Did you tell the cop that you're there? At what point did you come clean with Griff? Not for years later. <laughs> Not until maybe 10 years ago did I tell the whole story. I was telling, I was honestly telling stories in my monthly columns, and I decided I better come clean with this one. And I told the story. I bet he never forgot the car beat after that. No, he never did. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> was that and was that your only uh, off-field adventure? Uh, no, no, I, I've had a couple others. Anything you'd <laughs> like to share? Well, uh, in one case, I was uh, flying a uh, seaplane up in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and on takeoff and a Super Cub on floats, the uh, engine actually did fail and uh, had to put it down and uh, tried to get it back to the uh, lake. Almost made it, except the floats of the airplane scraped along the top of an airplane that was parked along the uh, shoreline. And the airplane flipped over, went on its back, and uh, we had to get ourselves out of the airplane and then swim to shore. Wow. And uh, that happened as a result of some uh, contamination in the fuel system that had dislodged and clogged the fuel filter. Wow. That, uh, that was but, in 1972. Interesting. I had one off airport landing. I was teaching a student in a 152 out of San Jose, California. <clears throat> we were down south of the Silicon Valley out over the fields, ironically practicing engine failures. And you know how you every now and then you just give it a little power to make sure the engine's still there and clear it out. Well, I did that, and the engine wasn't still there. Nothing happened when I pushed it forward. And, and, and he was all set up for an emergency landing in a field. He did, it, luckily, did a great job. At about 500 feet is where we discovered that uh, we had no engine. And I said, you know what? You're set up good. Just land it right there, straight ahead. Just land it. And he did. Landed right there in a field, uh, parallel with the crops, into the wind. And we landed. It was no damage. Everything was fine. And then we got out of the airplane wondering, now what? <laughs> there were no cell phones. But there was a farmhouse. We walked toward the farmhouse to see if we could use their phone. And uh, turns out... Is that out a the farmer's daughter joke? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish it was. Farmer comes out, offers us, hey, guys, we don't get many visitors here. You want some lemonade? And so me and my student are sitting on the porch drinking lemonade, talking to this guy about what happened and why we're... Land and he wasn't upset that we landed in his field or anything like that. And I thought, you know, at some point, I probably need to call somebody, tell him what happened here. <laughs> Uh, it turns out it was a fuel line that had come off. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. You know, it, I do find it amazing with, with all the risks that there are with generally, with, you know, flying in general, that realistically, uh, for off-field landings, the record's surprisingly good. It's not, you know, you, you fly the plane all the way. I think the lessons that each of you teach people often prevail and, and people walk away from an awful lot of accidents. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, you want to hear a great story? Ask Brian to tell you about his uh, charter flight with Steve Jobs. <laughs> Brian, please tell me about your charter flight with Steve Jobs. <laughs> it was actually not a charter. It was a, a corporate flight. I was a contract pilot for uh, ACM Aviation up in San Jose, and uh, I was flying. I was a captain of an Aero 4, and uh, we... I was set to go pick them up, pick Steve Jobs and uh, Mike Markla, the number one, the guy who gave Wozniak and Jobs all their money to get their you know, little computer idea going. So I was to pick the two of them up at uh, Carmel Valley, which is a small airport up near just south of Monterey, not there anymore. Uh, but it's an unimproved field with, uh, you know, in a box canyon, a little bit of elevation and no wind and a hot day. And I went to pick them up and they showed up with all these computer boxes monitors they were actually full of uh, boxes of uh, the Macintosh computer had just come out I think so we had all these they wanted to carry as much as they could in the cargo carry them on their lap put a, as many of these in the airplane as they could with two of them and me in a, in a normally aspirated Piper Arrow 4 
and it was like 90 degrees plus out, no wind, taking off toward trees and obstacles, and I wasn't comfortable with this, so I, I, I got the book out, and, and I don't know if you've seen the book, the movie uh, Jobs with Ashton Kutcher. If you've seen that or anybody who's seen that would understand the demeanor of Steve Jobs when you don't do something he wants. And Ashton Kutcher nailed it, nailed Steve Jobs to a T, and he was very upset with me, yelling, screaming, and I said, I've got to look and see if we can do this. And I remember, I literally have a memory of dripping sweat onto the spaghetti charts that were the Piper takeoff distance charts and trying to figure out if we could do this. To keep the story short, uh, I decided we can't do this. And he was upset, and I said, I have a better idea. I'll fly the airplane to Monterey. You guys drive with all this equipment to Monterey. It's got a longer runway. It's cooler. It's into the wind. There's no obstacles, <clears throat> so on and so forth, and I'll meet you there. It's a 20-minute drive, a five-minute flight. Uh, I flew there. They met me there. Um, the cooler heads prevailed in, in Mike Markula because he talked jobs into doing that, and he argued that we'd just done it last week or last month or we'd done this before, and it was fine, and uh, he was trying to talk me into doing it. Uh, I didn't cave. I figured, you know what? I don't. If I get fired, I don't care. At least I'm alive. Um, yep. So I, pick, I picked them up in Monterey, and I might have exaggerated the takeoff roll. Like I didn't rotate right away, and I did a really shallow climb out <laughs> just to make it look like well, if we'd have done this in Carmel Valley, guess what would have happened? Uh, we'd have hit trees. Wow. We wouldn't have made it. And, and so I might have done that, exaggerating that a little bit. Landed in San Jose. I'm offloading all their computer boxes. It was uneventful, except for the pouting Steve Jobs. And uh, while I was putting the airplane to bed, the line service guy came up to me and said, yeah, Mike wants to see you in his office. I'm like, oh, God, here he goes. And I'm walking up there like you'd be thinking of all the arguments in your head of why you're late to dinner when your wife was cooking you a dinner. And I'm getting all these arguments in my head. And I walk into his office. He sits me down. He says, Brian, what are we paying you? Which totally threw me off guard. I was not prepared to answer that. But I told him. And keep a long story short, he said, all right, well, in the interest of uh, safety, we're going to double your pay because anybody who's willing to stand up to Steve Jobs the way you did is what we want here at, at ACM, and, and they doubled my pay. So instead of getting fired, I got a, a pay raise for doing the right thing, and, and that really resounded in my attitude towards safety, uh, you know, because had I been fired that day, who knows what decisions I might have made further down the road in my career. What a fascinating story and so true. I mean, the fact that, that, first of all, you made the right decision. You're here today because of it. We have iPhones because of it. Yeah, anybody and, with an iPhone. Uh, yeah, you guys owe me one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Might not have had that. Um, maybe, maybe. And, and you got positively rewarded for making the right decision. Thankfully, but you know, a lot of people aren't. A lot of people are chastised for making the right decision. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. I have to tell you a story about one of uh, how I learned to make a decision. I was flying, a, speaking of Piper Arrows, I was flying a Piper Arrow in uh, Kenya uh, with uh, Brian's mother and uh, another couple. And we were heading toward a, the Mount Kenya Safari Club, which was down in Nanyuki. Great place to go, fabulous lodge, very expensive, but it was going to be the visit of a lifetime. And as we were heading down there, we came across some thunderstorms. And they were all over the damn place. And I told Frank, who was sitting in the right seat, I said, Frank, if we go this way and then that way and then this way, we can get around those things. And Frank said, forget it. Let's go back to Nairobi. I said, why? We, we've paid all this money, deposits on our fantastic vacation. We're going to have to give it all up. And he looked at me and he said, Barry, 10 years from now, you won't know the difference. And that helps to make a decision. He was right. Absolutely true. Who cared? It's a very, very good point. And, you know, you're here to tell it because you made that decision and the other one's an unknown. And I might not be here if he hadn't made that decision. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Which brings us to our last photo of the evening. Yeah, well, look, that's a great picture. That was taken on my retirement flight. It was Father's Day, in addition to being my retirement flight. My son, Brian, was my first officer on that flight. It was on the summer solstice, longest day of the year. And coming along for the ride was Brett, 
my first grandson, Brian's son. And we refer to this trio here as BS1, BS2, and BS3. That's a photo full of Schiff right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my retirement flight. And you can look carefully, you'll see Brett is wearing a uh, cute little uniform shirt made for him by Brian's wife, Lynn. That's amazing. What a, what a wonderful photo and a wonderful memory. And, and, and what a great way to, uh, to really close that particular phase of your flight, of your and life. A, and in a bit, a bit of irony, we, we touched down with a beautiful greaser, he did, uh, in Los Angeles, right at sunset. Yeah, it was, it was great. That's <laughs> after having gone down to 18,000 feet and buzzing the Grand Canyon. I had a lot of friends on board. I had to do that. <laughs> that was fun. And I and I do know, uh, obviously, uh, there was another one that you uh, um, that I did get get from you. As um, let me show that one here. Uh, speaking of flying and and canyon things, I can't I I can't skip these. Um, you've got one here. Let me show this. You've got one here of another interesting runway. That's a duster strip in New Zealand. And the guy wanted to show me how you really can fly that thing easily. Uh, he gave me a few takeoffs and landings. Obviously a one-way strip. You wouldn't want to land the going downhill. And you wouldn't want to take off going uphill. And it, it's, it's a, a challenge. You better have you enough energy on that runway going up over the top or you're not going to make it. You start rolling backwards on the land. I was going to say, you landing. must have a heck of a lot of power going up if you're going to, if you're going to even make it, make it all the way to the top on that one. And and a, lot show, of speed, a lot of airspeed to flare with, too. And I'll show one more here since we're running out of time. Let's see if I can get this one to come up. And, that and while is, you're loading it, I'll just say we were happy to headline for the debate tonight. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the warm-up team, right? Yeah. Now, some people look at this picture, and they think I intentionally flew under the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's just not true. Back in 1956, I was 18, I got my seaplane rating up at Sausalito, and I took a friend up for my first passenger flight in a seaplane. It was a, a Luscom on floats, and he said, let's land under the bridge, and I said, okay, great, let's do that, and I set up an approach for landing under the bridge, and I noticed the water was really, really rough, and it looked like it was way too rough to land an airplane on floats, so I said, we're going to have to go around, and I added power, and we went around. Uh -huh. I mean, <laughs> right. Good decision. Somehow in the process, flying underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, but totally legally and only in the interest of safety. I had to do it. In the interest of safety. And of course, <laughs> the education. Hey, I, was, I was a teenager. What do you want? Absolutely, and, and certainly a uh, a good good picture to to, to end on before that. And, and as you said, of course, we're uh, we're we're the opener for uh, tonight's presidential debate. Um, uh, can't imagine it's going to be as entertaining as this one. Certainly not as not as <laughs> enjoyable. Um, I, I would just like to thank both of you, Barry Schiff, Brian Schiff. Thank you so, so much for taking the time out and joining us here on Social Flight Live, sharing your stories and, and helping inspire everyone during a time that is really challenging, I think, for, for a lot of people, even as we work our way through it and hopefully are starting to come out the other side of it. It's so great to, to hear stories from, from folks like both of you and, and the family life and the aviation life that you have each lived. Thank you for inviting us, Jeff. We really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for having us and also for doing what you're doing. I, th I know that you're bringing a lot of good entertainment and camaraderie to aviation at a time when everybody really needs it. So thank you for what you're doing as well. You are so, so welcome, and thank you to both of you. And for all of those uh, that have joined us this evening here, um, we really appreciate uh, everything that you've done and the fact that you're joining us. We will be back next Tuesday, as always, Tuesday, October 6th at 8 p.m. with Vans Aircraft founder Richard Van Grunsvid. And we were going to follow that on the 13th with a T-51 build night, another night where we're going to just take the camera around this beast behind me show you the project here with the boys, take you through what we're doing and how we're making progress. Um, the week after that, October 20th, we are back with Mike Bush talking annual inspections. And we're gonna round out the end of the month just before Halloween on the 27th with John Williams 
of Titan Aircraft. Again, thank you so, so much, Barry and Brian Schiff. You, you, all you have to do is uh, do a search on the internet, get some of the books, follow what they're doing, both of them. There's so much education out there, so many articles written, and, um, and just, just, just a wealth of knowledge from a true aviation family. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jeff Simon, Blue Skies. Thank you.